Alright so friends, welcome back to Opus L and I where we are back on our Garth Nix bullshit. Since the SAC after strike is ongoing, I decided to turn to books for my Halloween cosplay inspiration. I am complete trash for the Old Kingdom series, as you may remember from my Viking Lariel videos last year. So this year I'm making a block printed surcoat from the final book of the original trilogy, Abhorson. This outfit actually contains some fairly substantial spoilers, and I will try my best not to be overt in my description, but I wanted to give a fair warning to anyone who was planning to read the books but hadn't yet. This is your chance to save this video for later. In the books, the world is split between a country called Ancelstier that has technology roughly on par with the late Edwardian era but with no magic, and the Old Kingdom, a country to the north that's technologically on par with the European Middle Ages but with lots of magic. This is why I'm taking historical inspiration from medieval fashion for the majority of these outfits. This garment comes from a scene in the third book where Lariel and company have reached a temporary safe haven and are gearing up to head out on the next leg of their adventure. Since it's meant to be an outfit for traveling and fighting, I've taken my inspiration from 13th century knightly surcoats that are drafted along the same lines as the IKEA cyclists I made a couple of years ago. These surcoats are shorter than a cyclist though and sometimes split front and back for riding. They serve the dual purposes of protecting the wearer and armor from sun and weather and to be a canvas to display their heraldry prominently. And that's exactly what happens in the book. Lyriel is given a surcoat that displays the arms of two different families together. While this video is a continuation of my plan to eventually make a historically inspired version of every outfit that Sabriel and Lyriel wear over the course of the books, like I said, complete trash. It's also the beginning of a series where I will experiment with different ways to create decorated fabric to make said outfits. It will cover block printing, embroidery, stencils, beading, applique, and more. Let me know in the comments what technique you'd like to see next. All right, everyone, go grab your cuppa. Today, I am drinking Civil Disobedience from August Uncommon. It's got Lapsang Souchong, so it is nice and smoky, and has cardamom and allspice and maple, so it just smells and tastes like a fall campfire. Let's get into it. Before I can do anything else, I need to design the stamps. I generally like to use my iPad since it's easy to iterate and resize as needed. First up, the Abhorsen's key. I'm just tracing and altering some heraldic clip art. I also like to make the teeth of the key, fun fact, they're actually called wards, into an E because my SCA name is Ellen and I'm a giant nerd. Next, the Claire Seven Pointed Star. Seven is a really important number in the series. There were seven spirits of creation, seven bells used in necromantic magic, seven books in the series, if you count Creature in the Case, which I am because it serves my purposes for this point. It's always been my favorite number too. When I did my senior thesis art show in college, I painted seven pieces. Last time I did a block printing project, I used a soft linoleum, which is really great for paper printmaking and really not great for fabric printing. So this time I popped down to my local art store and picked up some hard lino, which came in these handy pre-cut blocks, just the sizes I needed. Because the print will be mirrored from how I draw it onto the lino block, I need to reverse the key because I forgot to do that before printing out the designs. I'm using some graphite sticks on the backside of the paper so that I can transfer the design to the block. And then after the lines are on, I'll go over that with a fine tip sharpie that won't rub off. I'm also marking the design on the back of the block. This way I'll know the orientation when it's face down.
I saw a printmaker on another platform do this, paint their block with acrylic paint before carving, and it made so much sense to me. This way I can really easily see what I've removed and what remains. It's the first time I've done this and it worked so well, I'm incorporating this step into the process forever. quick test print to see if I need to carve anything deeper and which paint loading technique works best with the new blocks. I did need to carve a couple places deeper and the sponge applicator is still optimal. I will test the gold paint as well and I would have tested the silver but it hadn't arrived yet. I want to minimize the number of seams in this surcoat, so I'm using my cyclist to make a pattern that incorporates the side gores. And since the front and back are substantially the same, I'll make just one pattern piece with both front and back necklines on it. I can prick the front neckline, and when I trace over it with chalk, it'll make a dotted line I can then connect.
I managed to remember to actually hang dry my linen this time. I usually forget it in the dryer until it's done, and then I have to spend twice as long ironing it. The bar for my overhead camera rig is the real MVP here, since it's been raining all this week and I couldn't hang it outside. I'm cutting each piece individually, and because the fabric isn't directional, I can position the pieces such that the diagonal side seams are butted up against each other, optimizing fabric use. Now, according to the book, the surcoat should actually be quartered rather than divided per pale, but I didn't want the extra bulk of a seam at the waist underneath where the belt would go. I decided to just make it party color instead, since that's another way to marshal arms. That is to say, smush them together to indicate heredity. Time to measure out the pattern spacing. I want the stars to repeat in a diagonal pattern, so I'm drawing a grid out but only marking the places where the stamps will go. Every other intersection offset every row. Since the stars are basically square, this grid is 3 inches by 3 inches. I'm using a couple layers of flannel in order to cushion the stamp and protect my table. I did miss one when stamping a star, and while it didn't make much of a difference to the look on the fabric, I did have to stop for a second and scrub the paint off the table before it fully dried. I had to stop printing about three times per pattern piece to clean the drying paint buildup off of the stamp. That is a lot less than I had to clean the stamp during the dragon tunic, and the hard lino held up to the repeated scrubbing much better than the soft.
Once the stars are finished, it's time to repeat the process on the blue pieces. The steps are substantially the same, except that because the keys are longer and thinner, my grid is 2 and 7 eighths inches by 3 and 7 eighths inches. When I went to start printing the silver keys, the paint was a little disappointing. It was not nearly as opaque as the gold. So after printing the first two keys twice and freaking out over getting the registration correct, I decided to mix some white paint into the silver to make it show up more and that worked perfectly. Thank you to all of my current and continuing coffee members. Your support and the support of all of my members and croissants makes it easier to do what I do and to provide quality content for everyone to watch. Thank you so much. Stick around after this brief commercial break to see the Circo construction. After all the individual pieces are printed and ironed, I will start the construction by sewing the fronts and backs together, leaving the bottom of the seam open to the top of my upper thigh for the riding slit. I like to backstitch the ends of seams like that several times for stability. Then I will stitch the shoulders and side seams.
can then fill the front and back seam allowances individually on opposite sides of the seam, continuing that down to become the hems of the riding slit. All the other seams will get flat filled toward the back of the surcoat after hanging overnight to let the side seam stretch. I wasn't exactly sure how I wanted to handle the neck hole and arm size. I had three different options. Make a shaped facing for each opening, use bias tape as a facing as I did in the cyclist project, or finish them with a rolled hem. After the week I've had, I didn't want to fuss with the extra work of a shaped facing, and I don't love how a bias facing sometimes has a tendency to flip outwards, so a rolled hem it is. I finally get to use this hem marker on a garment short enough to not be awkward. Probably I should have ironed it before marking, but there's no turning back now. Once I have smoothed and connected the curve, I can cut the excess off and hem the bottom, which apparently I did completely off camera. Have I told you about my week? Anyway, after that, we're all finished.
Thank you for joining me today. I feel like I learned a lot doing this project, like how much easier block printing is with the proper materials and how to work around paint shipping delays and computer malfunctions and illness. All in all, I am really happy with how this came out and I'm glad that partner and I researched the heraldry to make sure that I could wear it to SCA events if I wanted to without being presumptuous. Also, congratulations to Emily who won the 10K giveaway and shall any day now be enjoying her gold work bag. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe. You know the drill. Click the bell for notifications and maybe give this video a share to social media. If you're looking for me online, I am at Opus L and I everywhere, but you can find me most readily on my Discord. Until next time, be kind, do the work, continue supporting marginalized people, and keep creating. Quill. Well.